<clears throat> so I like to share my experience on IPv6. So a actually, uh, well, I'm working for CERNET, China Education Research Network. It is started in 1994. That's the first internet backbone in mainland China. Currently, we have about 2,000 universities connected and about 20 million subscribers. And uh, recently, actually, we upgrade our backbone to 100G. We have 23 cities connected with 100G DWDM system. We have our own duck fibers, about 30,000 kilometers. And uh, that's the website. And uh, this is side report. That means from a single atomic system, the total number of IPv4 addresses announced. And you can see our network rated like 33 in the top list. The first one is China Telecom Community Internet Provider. You can also see like a DoD network, Apple Computer, MIT, all those big networks. And also, actually, we are self-funded. Even we are academic network. However, the operation fee is from the member universities, so we do net flow in every router and do statistics. And uh, actually, we have the list of the universities consume most the traffic. And uh, actually, we found that's very high correlation to the university ranking systems. So higher the traffic, the better the university. <laughs> and however, in total, in China, there are 320 million students. So from the very beginning, we realized we do not have enough IPv4 address. So we start IPv6 <coughs> back to 1998. And currently, we have another backbone called CERNET 2. It is an IPv6 only backbone. And uh, currently, there are 300 universities connected and uh, about 3 million users. When we start design the CERNET 2, actually, we thought uh, we need to make decisions either dual stack or IPv6 only. And uh, our decision is IPv6 only. The reason, there are several reasons. Because we have CERNET, and uh, that's IPv4. So we can try IPv6 only networks. And uh, there are several other reasons. And uh, for complexity, CERNET, IPv4 is a production network. So we try to design CERNET as simple as possible. However, for CERNET 2, that's a test bed. So we try to design CERNET 2 as chaotic as possible. And uh, there are multiple atomic systems and from multiple vendors. And for transition strategy, OK, actually, CERNET, it, we are self-funded. That means the students and professor need to pay for using IPv4. However, CERNET 2 is government-funded. IPv6 only, so it is a free network. On the other hand, the CERNET is somehow contested for IPv4. And the CERNET 2, it is also the 10G backbone, so it's light loaded, high performance. So the trade off is if you want a free and uh, high performance network, then you should use IPv6 rather than IPv4. And also, we are trying some other things. So it is, uh, this is the backbone of CERNET 2, IPv6 only. It is from multiple vendors. Actually, it's from the routers from Huawei, Bitway, Cisco, Juniper, and even Hitachi. So that's mixed. Even in a single pop, there are multiple vendors. And uh, those are the traffic statistics. You can see the increased use of the IPv6 traffic. And also, we're running the IPv6 exchange point in mainland China. Connect a community IPv6 testbed, including China Telecom, China Unicom, and China Mobile. And uh, the routing table of the IPv6 keep increasing 
and the traffic are also keep increasing. And uh, you may wonder what's the applications. So there are a lot of video applications in Cernet 2 IPv6. That's another trick because uh, the most of the videos are some called copyrighted, protected. But however, we talk to the video sources and they told them, okay, we are doing IPv6. Do you want, willing to try it? Please provide content for free to the students in the university. So that's the reason we can get a lot of traffic. Also, actually, we hosted the first official Olympic website back to year 2008 for the Beijing Olympics. And also, we got another funding from government to upgrade 100 campus networks to IPv6. And uh, okay, those are the IPv6 only servers in 100 universities. Another thing is actually we are running multicast, SSM only multicast in CERNET 2 backbone. No ASM, only <coughs> specific source multicast because of the security reasons. And uh, we ask 100 universities, each university provide a video source and we use single source multicast to distribute in CERNET to backbone. However, for some clients, which cannot support SSM only, so we would put a gateway between SSM and ASM. So those are the video source based on SSM IPv6. Another thing, IPv6 in theory, it should be secure. However, in reality, actually there are several things you have to be considered seriously. For example, the neighbor discovery attack, the RA attacked, and uh, their Slack address and the DHCP stateless address and the DHCP v6 stateful. However, we strongly suggest to use DHCP v6 stateful to assign addresses. In the old days, you cannot do that because Windows XP cannot support that, but currently, Windows 7, 8, iOS, and uh, Mac X all can support DHCP v6 stateful. That gave a much, much better control for security and address control. And also, well, because of neighbor discovery attack and RA attacks, so actually we are working in IETF called South Address Val Validation Improvement working group. So that's something called SAVI. And uh, we strongly recommend if you want to try IPv6 seriously, please try to get SAVI supported layer two and the layer switchers. Otherwise, if the hackers get into the IPv6 domain, you will have a lot of troubles. Another issue is transition. That's a quite, quite important issue because actually I'm the person against the dual stack. <laughs> okay, for IPv4, that's good. And in the future, if IPv6 only, that's good. However, for dual stack, you need to spend probably at least 1.5 times of the effort and the cost in order to maintain a dual stack network. And so, actually, when we start IPv6, we are looking for killer applications for IPv6. Originally, we thought video is the killer application. However, like YouTube can support video. And later, we thought P2P application is the killer application. However, net traversal can also support P2P applications. And finally, we realized, actually, the ability of communication with IPv4 internet is the killer application of IPv6. So I can tell you the story of what we experienced. 
we start CERNET project, that's IPv4. And in the year 1998, we run IPv6 over IPv4, joint six boom. And the later, actually, we run DuStack. It is a network called the Natural Science Foundation of China Network. And uh, then in 2004, we start CERNET2 project I just mentioned, that's IPv6 only network. Then we try the opposite way of turning V4 over V6, that's the IETF working group software. However, finally we realize the communication between V4 and V6 is very important. That's the killer application. So we work in behave working group in IETF. And later we also extend the translation into double translations and back to software working group. So the idea is stateless translation. That means ac actually <clears throat> because the address space is quite different. So it is not easy to do stateless translation between V4 and V6. The idea is how about use a subset of the IPv6 address and uh, build a mapping relationship between v4 and v6. And uh, later, if you really get the IPv6 running, you can use rest of the IPv4 v, v6 addresses. So that, that means use a subset of the IPv6. That's the idea of stateless translation between v4 and v6. And my student gave a name of it called IVI because in Roman representation of the numbers, IV means four, VI means six, so IVI means V4 and V6 can talk. Okay, we have a translator between CERNET IPv6, back, IPv4 network and the CERNET2 IPv6 and the stateless translator. So IPv6 only clients and IPv6 servers can talk to IPv6 internet as well as the IPv4 internet. And then we extend that to 100 campus networks. So each campus network we allocate slash 24. By the way, that's before the depletion of the IPv4 address in APNIC. So however, they use that in IPv6, that's equivalent to slash 64 IPv6 address. So that's the website, it's still alive, you can take a look. And uh, so, for example, in wireless, they are SSID, IVI. So when the students use like Windows 7, Windows 8, or iOS, you can get IPv6 only <coughs> address and through translator, they can talk to the IPv4 internet. So you can see Windows 7, that's the address, mapped address. And uh, you can find the relationship with V4. And you may wondering what's the traffic. So the top one is the IPv4 traffic aggregated in CERNET backbone. And it's about like a 70 gigabit BPS, oh, 170 G BPS. And the second is IPv4, it's about 50 G BPS. And the bottom one is the translated traffic because that's a GE interface, so it's reached about 900 Mac BPS. And also like you can try the IPv6 test. So those are the testing web page. And uh, also like uh, the DHCPv6 assignment of the traffic. And those are the RFCs actually we worked and uh, published related to stateless translation, RFC 60, 52, 61, 44, 61, 45, 62, 19, and uh, 6, 7, 91. So I'm the author of all those. RFCs, co-authors. And uh, you may wonder if this is just academic trials. Not really, because like uh, Cisco in their ASR 1K and the 9K, they, you can find uh, 
the implementation of those RFCs. So finally, the lessons we learned is, in the old days, IETF recommend dual stack where you can, turn in where you should, and the translation where you must. However, I believe, uh, based on our experience, that's for existing IPv4 users. And based on Cernet2 experience, our recommendation is for new internet users and the internet of things, translation, so build an IPv6 only network and use IPv6 only. And the translation where you can, turn in when you should, and the due stack where you must. So this is the lessons we learned because of the time. So I stop my presentation. Any questions? Hola, hola. Primero que nada, muchas gracias, Sin. ¿Alguna pregunta? De Sir, ¿verdad? Uh, okay. sí. Yes, repeat your, organi or your organization and name anyway. I'm Luhan from Outside Heaven. Uh, Professor Lee, it's a fantastic presentation. I actually got two questions for you. Uh, what's the percentage of uh, each different traffic? in the IPv6, they are H or HTTP traffic, or they are most uh, uh, file sharing traffic. And uh, a second question would be, uh, because I'm Chinese as well, I never studied in a Chinese university, but I learned from my fellow friends that that's actually a huge financial incentive uh, for the college student to use V6 over V4 because uh, the state is not charging students for the V6 traffic. Uh, the, the, the second question would be, without this financial intense in incentive, what do you see about the V6 traffic? Will that be a huge job? Like, without this financial encouragement, will, will V6 suddenly drop to 1% instead of 20% of V4 traffic? What do you think of that? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, the first question is for IPv6, actually HTTP and the video are the major applications for that. Is there any difference from the V4 traffic? Uh, well, it's, it's similar. It's similar. However, for IPv4, like, like you can see, like for example, the, the WeChat, in China is very popular and like Skype, those applications can only support IPv4. So in that case, you cannot do IPv6 or even you cannot do IPv4 v6 translation. However, because we run double translation, so some of the traffic can carry on IPv6 only backbones. So that's the distribution. And actually your question is, very good, like because IPv6 is free for the students. That gave a big, big advantage for using IPv6. If both equally charged, probably the, well, we believe currently the V6 versus V4 is about more than 50%, then we, we believe that will drop to 10%. So. So actually, communication is the major issue. That's why we work on translation of those kind of things. Thank you very much. Alguna otra pregunta para Sim? Nombre, por favor. Hello, hello. Sí, buenas tardes. Eh, bueno, primeramente, señor Lin, eh, muy excelente su presentación. Mi nombre es Gregorio Manzano, soy de la Real Académica de Venezuela. De verdad que tengo muchísimas preguntas, pero voy a tratar de, de decir las más relevantes. No, primeramente, ¿cuál ha sido el impacto o cuál fue el impacto desde el punto de vista de, de adiestramiento del personal a cargo de las universidades que son parte de, de la Real Académica de China? Eh, ¿Cuál ha sido, cómo fue el Roma? con respecto a adquisición de equipamiento, 
cuál ha sido el tipo de problema que tuvieron, de problemas de interoperabilidad entre, por ejemplo, Cisco y Huawei, equipamiento... Sí. Ya, per, perdón que te interrumpa y te prometo sí, que no es mi intención decir lo que voy a decir ahorita. Y bueno, yo soy el tipo, típico, el tipo de persona que me encantan los foros donde hay muchas preguntas, pero ya estamos fuera de tiempo honestamente. No sé si Una puedes sola. resumirlo, disculpa, te lo prometo. Los ponentes van a estar aquí claro. unos días más, seguramente van a verse en, en, en el hall, pero quizás resumirlo a dos preguntas, por favor, para no alargar más el periodo y poder tener un break al menos de de 10 minutos, disculpe. No, no te preocupes. Eh, bueno, Arela, lo que más me interesa desde el punto de vista de recurso humano, es decir, eh, ¿cómo, ha sido, cómo fue el roadmap eh, en el, la curva de aprendizaje, qué problemas consiguieron para el adiestramiento y, y capacitación del personal de la, de la Universidad de China. Y la segunda pregunta, ¿cuáles fueron los problemas más relevantes, los problemas técnicos más relevantes en la interoperabilidad la conectividad inicial entre diferentes fabricantes. Gracias. Uh, okay, thanks for the question. Yeah. Oh, okay, training is very important because even the students they like to try new things. Still, that take some time for them to familiar with IPv6. That's why actually we believe university deploy IPv6 is very important for the internet community. Otherwise, there is very difficult for, for the ISPs to learn IPv6. And for IPv6 equipment, that's also a good question because interoperability is not very good in IPv6 in the days we try it, for example, our network, like Cerner 2, is multiple vendors. It's very funny. We have two China, Chinese vendors. One is Huawei, another is Bitway. When we connect those two networks, the one of the router actually crashed. However, we put a Juniper in between, no problems. So sometimes you need to use those famous routers to isolate the problem. But later, actually, the Chinese vendors solved the problem. Okay. Bueno, con esta pregunta finalizamos lo que es la primera parte del foro. Eh, vamos a tener, los invito a tener un break de aproximadamente 20 minutos, no más de eso, porque si todos, si hay quórum en la sala, en 22 minutos comenzaríamos la siguiente parte. Un millón de gracias a todos.